All right. Hooray. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, cool. So, so uh, welcome to the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up. Today we're talking to Tim and Angelos, and you folks are from the Web Tools team? That's right. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to... I'm going to run through my community links for this week, and then we'll just jump right over to, to all the fun stuff you have to show off. So let me share my desktop here. And I don't have a huge amount of links for today, um, but they're, they're cool ones. Uh, so first of all, there's an update for Azure App Configuration. Um, so Azure App Configuration is a kind of relatively new thing. It's kind of a configuration server sort of idea where you can centralize your application configuration. Um, so that, wor that works, especially if you're sharing configuration among like different microservices or, or you know, working with deployment pipelines, stuff like that. Um, so here I'm including this in the um, show links for this week too, and I, I'll post all these at the end after I go through them. So, but uh, the update here is that the initial design for this was based on a timer base. So it was updating every 30 seconds by default. And the new setup is set up to based on activity-based refresh. And then uh, the other thing in here is that you can actually include in your um, in your application and your web host configuration that it can you can set your ping for your refresh interval. So I thought that was neat. I actually haven't used this. I've kind of generally seen that it was out there, but I haven't haven't put it to use. So I'm interested if you know folks are watching or any comments on that, how it's working for you. All right, uh, another cool new release from the uh, from the Learn group. So this is a um, this is an actual like interactive tutorial, and so this is building ASP.NET Core web app with identity framework. So this is a nice thing where you go through, you work with the cloud shell and it configures resources for you and everything so you can just write in your browser you can work through and build stuff so like as i go through and configure things here it's you know activating sandbox and building stuff out and i'm getting points too which is neat <laughs> uh, and yeah and so you go through and you you uh, it includes things like uh customizing the ui and stuff like that so pretty cool love to see how they're cranking the, those things out it's always nice to gamify development too Exactly, exactly. Give me those points. Uh, this is nice from Odd here. He's he's uh, just reminding you that you can clean up your ASP.NET Core startup. Um, I notice this. My ASP.NET Core startups keep growing over time, and then the team keeps simplifying the startup, and then, my, and then I keep adding stuff in, and it keeps growing again. So uh, a nice pattern here, and Scott Allen has written some posts on this sort of thing generally in the past, too. Um, but moving things into extension methods. So instead of having just tons and tons of code, you can actually move stuff into an extension method, and then your startup gets a lot simpler because you can just say, you know, configure this, add this, do this. So um, good reminder there. I like that the uh, examples even using the Swagger stuff that we're going to be talking about later too. Oh, cool, cool. Yep. All right, uh, Nate McMaster here, he's published a uh, .NET Global tool for uh, Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt is, is a, it provides you free HTTPS certificates. Uh, one thing that, that is required with that though is you have, to, you have to run and you have to manually renew them and that kind of stuff. So th this is nice, this is actually a, um, uh, what he's got set up here, you can include, um, here, it's middleware that says add Let's Encrypt. Um, so I believe, I thought I had also seen that there's a global tool for this, or I, I, I'm incorrect here. This is a uh, ASP.NET Core integration. So this is this is actually doing this in, in your middleware and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Excited to see that come out and, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, simplifying that process. All right, uh, Eric here posting about Razor components in Blazor. So Razor components are a way where you can kind of build self-contained uh, chunk of UI. Um, and just a reminder that you can use this inside of Blazor applications. So here he walks through creating a Razor component and uh, you know showing how to use that with parameters. And um, yeah, just kind of a kind of a quick walk through there. I think we added support for static content in those libraries in 16.2 for VS as well. Oh, cool. You can have static cool. content okay. in your libraries that you can serve. 
That's right. That's right. Yeah, I remember that was in the the release post, but there was a ton of stuff in there. So yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, okay, and I I will be publishing the this will go in the YouTube notes and in the I'll publish them in the chats and everything. And that is it for me. So I'm going to pop back. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'll go back over to you folks. All right. All right. So before we dive in too much, you folks are on the web tools team. Can you, what, what uh, sort of stuff is this web tools for like all of visual studio? Is this how? Well, I'm a, so I'm a PM for .NET. Um, so I mainly focus on .NET projects and, project support and tooling in Visual Studio, mainly on Windows. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we use for .NET is available for other stacks as well. Uh, but what we show here today, and primarily what I'm interested in is .NET and Visual Studio on Windows. But the team I work with also owns other features in Visual Studio, like publishing. Uh, so later on, maybe we can talk a bit about publishing to Azure, provisioning, that kind of stuff. Uh, we also work on the project system support. So if your project is dealing with user secrets, so tooling around that. So um, all sorts of tooling specifically for web projects, ASP.NET, Azure Functions, that kind of stuff in Visual Studio on Windows. Great. I love the user secrets, by the way. That's been a huge game changer just for how I develop to not have to worry about like, oops, did I push a key out to GitHub or something? Reduces yeah. anxiety. We like that. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I'm kind of, I'm on the other side of the room, literally from uh, his part of the team, um, more on the web editors side of things. Um, the HTML editor, the CSS editor, uh, browser link, um, something that our team owns also. Um, and we picked up the HTTP REPL tool that we'll be talking about today. Um, so, yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Um, so what do you have to show off today? Then? Do, you want to do you want to intro? All right. Yeah. So um, the idea is that the, the idea was born out of the need to quickly explore and learn and test your APIs. And as projects get bigger and bigger and microservices gain traction, we've seen people that um, are, are, are breaking up their application to smaller chunks. And it's much more likely to now have to explore uh, a chunk of the application that you didn't necessarily write. Um, so it's not necessarily for a team, it's for all kinds of scenarios, whether you're experimenting with an API from a vendor, uh, an internal microservices, uh, microservice from another team member, uh, maybe you're looking at uh, different offerings and you wanna compare them, the idea is you want to explore or test APIs. And um, typically, whenever you work with a web project, specifically with .NET, we just assume you wanted a web browser. Uh, and we just let you write up your code and fire up the web browser. Uh, but as we started getting popularity with our web API projects and that kind of stuff, we realized that opening up a browser is not that useful. Uh, so we thought to ourselves, well, what do we, what, what's, what's handy here? What's useful? What's helpful? Um, and what we realized is that people wanted to focus on the exploration and the learning, and they didn't want to focus too much on getting the syntax right or getting the authentication right or things like that. Um, so the suggestion was born, well, we, there's this idea of a loop of you, you do something, you check it, you, you do something more, you check it, you do something more. And um, there's, there's different technology stacks that really capitalize on that, like Python with REPL was very popular. And we're thinking, well, what if we applied that kind of concept um, on, a, on a command line tool that lets you explore an API, kind of like we'd explore a folder uh, with files. So it's something that you don't have to worry too much about getting the commands right. It's everything that you're familiar with. You don't have to worry about remembering what you did before. You just keep going, and you keep exploring, and you keep learning. It's an it's a idea. It's a prototype. It's a, it's a first release. We are hoping that the community will give us lots of ideas as to how they want to extend it, how they want to use it, what kind of integration they want to see next. We'll talk about our plans, but the main focus is to get feedback from the community. What do you think we can do more uh, with this tool? Cool. Okay. I, so, I think we should go with a, a demo team, right? Demo. Yeah. Right. yeah. Let's see. Let me switch over to my machine here. So. Um, basically, I've got a, I've got a web API um, solution running here. This was just the, uh, you know, the default scaffolded template um, that was in the latest preview of Visual Studio um, for a web API. I added a few little things to it um, and added the swashbuckle to generate the swagger definition. Um, but otherwise, it's basically just the, the default um, template there. And then 
I've got a, this is a late breaking build of the HTTP REPL tool um, that I built about 15 minutes ago before walking over here. So it's not the one that's on NuGet at the moment, but it's basically the same thing. Um, and so basically I'll just walk through connecting to it and, and seeing what, uh, what happens there. So connecting to it is pretty simple um, as far as just typing in the base address that you want to connect to. The tool will then go out and find the Swagger file based on convention. Um, so it has a, a set of paths that it uses. It looks up and tries to find where you have the Swagger file in, in your project. Um, you can see it, oh, where's Scott? <laughs> you can see uh, it managed to find it and it set the base address there. So now the cool thing is you can, we'll do an LS and Kind of like if you're doing, you know, checking what's in your directory, it shows we got a couple different endpoints here, a random endpoint, which is the one that I added, and a weather forecast um, endpoint that uh, was part of the default template. And so then just like browsing directory structure, you can uh, go ahead and CD into it. Um, you can see it's giving the types of uh, HTTP commands that you can issue against the endpoint, so it'll accept either a GET or a POST. Um, and to do that, you just literally type GET, and that's the response from the um, API endpoint there. Um, formatted the JSON, did some interesting colorization on it, with the purple and the green, but colorizes it to make it a little easier to read. And it's that simple to go ahead and just quickly test one of your, your endpoints on there. Um, there's a couple things that didn't show up on that uh, demo quite well, and that's we do have uh, like auto completion. So if you type CD and you can't remember exactly what it is, you can hit tab and it's going to auto complete um, through the options that you have since it knows what the endpoints are that are there. Um, another thing on here is so as you can see, the weather forecast one takes a post. So we can issue a post command. And what that's going to do is it actually opens up my default editor, which I have set as Visual Studio Code here, and gives me kind of a, a template of what that API expects you to be posting to it as part of the body. Mm -hmm. And it kind of fills in some default values there. Um, and you can go ahead and change it. Celsius 40, I think that's pretty hot. So I'm going to say that's too hot and save it, close it, and it goes ahead and posts it back to the server. And I have the server set to just respond with the same object back that also has the temperature in Fahrenheit with the conversion. So see, I, I did do my Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion correctly there. That was hot. Right. I love that. That's really handy because otherwise going through and manually creating that JSON and all that is just busy work, right? Right. Exactly. So to the extent that the, the Swagger definition file has the, the schema information in it for what it expects, um, the tool will try to respect that and generate some sample data or um, example stuff uh, for you to use for that. Um, you can also do it inline, or you can pass it a file if you've got what you want it to post in a file. There's some other options on the um, the post command to do it that way too, but that's kind of the, the quick and dirty way of doing the post there. Um, let's see. What else did I want to show on that? Um, so. Sorry, I'm late. Did you talk about how the swagger got found? like the heuristics about that stuff that we talked about? Yeah, just a little bit. Basically, we've got some uh, some predefined uh, lookups for what it's going to where it's going to try to look to find that swagger file based on the root uh, that you pass in when you do that connect command. Um, so we have a, a uh, just kind of default couple of settings in there that we look for it. But you can also um, change that. Uh, there's a preference in, in the tool, so you can change it if you're constantly having to tell it to look somewhere else for it because your particular project has decided to store it somewhere else. You can change the, the setting on the tool so you're not having to type that every time and it'll find it where you have it. We also um, just recently, um, I think just yesterday, the um, NuGet package went live with the change in it. We changed some things with the way it works um, so that we're now respecting the base address 
that is specified in the Open API 3 um, Swagger definition. Um, so if the Swagger definition actually specifies the address, we go ahead and use that. Um, Scott actually had a scenario where it was in there and the tool wasn't respecting it. Um, and so we uh, switched some things around so that the, the new connect command handles that situation properly. It'll find the Swagger file and then set the base address based on that. Let's see. Um, uh, what else did I want to show in here? Oh, um, we can talk about authentication and headers and things like that. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. That's a pretty common request that we're starting to get, and um, I know authentication is going to be a, a, a high priority for after the first release. Um, but for right now, there is somewhat of a workaround for for some of the common scenarios. The most common thing that we saw was that people wanted. Um, to be able to use bearer tokens and there's no like built-in way right now to say you know use this token but what you can do is um, just issue a set header command uh, and if i can remember what it is <laughs> um, authentication you should be able to tab and autocomplete on the uh, on yeah the that's right. Right. i think you can Yep, you can tab through and it will get there eventually. Author authorization, sure. We'll go with that. And then bearer, and then you know whatever your token is, you can put that there. That sets the header so that now any commands that you issue from that point forward, it's going to um, pass that authorization header with the command. We can see that working if uh, I'm going to do echo on so that that's going to have it echo back out to the screen what commands it's issue, it's uh, or what HTTP commands it's sending out. So if I do the get now, and then you look, this is the whole um, HTTP request that went out. You can see it got the authorization uh, header in there and then the response. And so that's gonna stay there for as long as the, uh, the tool is running till you exit it that header will be there, so you can continue using that same um, bearer token against all your API endpoints in there. Uh, and and it's showing up automatically. Like you've said it once, it's persistent, it's session persistent. Correct. So because you have echo on, it's showing up every time. If you didn't turn echo on, you'd really never know, right? Right. If you turn echo back yeah. off, and then you don't actually see it, you're just seeing the response if you don't have echo on. So you don't you don't yeah. know what it's doing. It's not actually sending it. We're not actually showing it. At this point, it, I, mean, I, I I have enjoyed you know talking with you about this and working on this uh, before you've shown it. And I'm curious. You're really getting to the point where it's just fit and finish now. Like it really it it, it works great. Have you thought about how it ought to look? Like should it feel like a prompt? I know you added the tilde after the you know like it, it you want it to feel like a like a shell of sorts, because it is a shell, but like from a syntax coloring perspective and how, how what, what the prompt should look like, like just kind of like, if you're gonna live here, if someone's gonna spend their life in this thing, what kind of little like quality of life improvements would you add? That's a good question. And we'd like to hear from the community on that and you, Scott. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know if you've had any um, I guess let me switch back to so they can see us talking. Um, Andrews, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback on those pieces of it. I don't have any feedback from the community yet, but I think one of the promises here is that it stays out of your way. The tool itself stays out of your way. So uh, I would take a pass at making sure that elements that shouldn't stand out are not standing out in terms of color schemes. Maybe de-emphasize some things um, and emphasize others. And maybe add some... Um, ways that people can know that their headers have been updated and they have changed and things mm -hmm. like that. So being aware of the context um, and then de-emphasizing things that are noisy and you don't really need. Uh, because the, the, the main point here is reusing things you already know. There should be no higher bar of entry in terms of learning commands or anything like that. So it's simple and not noisy, I think. It's met the goal. I think yeah. the main thing is going to be integrating with your tools and your, your tool chain as well we'll get to in a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess the only other thing that I really wanted to show um, with this was um, that you don't have to do this against a local 
um, endpoint. If there's a, a public endpoint that you want to explore, you can um, kind of dig into it using this tool. So I'm going to pull up another. Um, this is actually, yeah, the button here. Go back to me. Um, so this is actually the same tool, the, the released version so far, but running in Ubuntu on WSL2. <laughs> On, um, so I've got a little inception thing going on here, but um, I'm going to let's see, let me go ahead and connect to an endpoint that I was using for testing. So this is just a, a site that the um, the people who run the Swagger stuff and and keep up the spec um, have up there. Um, we were able to find the Swagger definition just like normal. You can run the ls command and kind of start exploring. You can see they've got some stuff with pets Let's go in there. So like just to, to just to your point about fit and finish, like as you're watching the customers and the folks that are watching right now, think about what you'd want this to look like. Is that the way you want it to look? Is that mm -hmm. is that representative of what you would think this feels like? Or would it be like little little things? Make the verbs all caps, or make them in color, or you know what would make you happy to spend all your days in this thing? Yeah, you can see that it was you know it was clearly uh, set up to mimic the normal um, right. uh, structure, showing the dot, the dot, dot, that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the things you're talking about, what what should be called out and what should be de-emphasized when you're seeing mm -hmm. the the output from these commands? Well, and so just to, as, a, as an interesting point, if I may derail you a bit, talk sure. about the dot meaning current directory for, for old people <laughs> and, uh, and what put and post mean in that context. I read that to mean that this endpoint as it is above will take a post or a put. So slash pet, you can post a pet or put a pet. And that's what dot means there. That that's correct. Yeah, that's that saying correct? where okay. you are right now. Um, post and put are your two options for that. And then there's other things inside of it, just you know, kind of like extra you know directories or, or files in it, and, and that kind of listing um, that you can also go to. But yeah, the dot means for this particular uh, endpoint, post and put are the two valid commands for it. Right. Now, folks in the comments here on Twitch. I uh, definitely think color is like not just a improvement, but a requirement. It's also worth pointing out, of course, that 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 Tim is in a regular console host here rather than Windows Terminal. But since this is a console application, it would work just fine with Windows Terminal. Uh, so much so that if you wanted to, you could actually add the HTTP REPL for your whatever project you're working on as a tab in Windows Terminal. And yeah. have oh, that that's cool. Tab. Yeah, I'll actually do a blog post on that tonight. Nice. I think that was... What about autocomplete? I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, there's a question about uh, doing things like displaying timing statistics for API calls. Is it possible to get kind of Ooh, more... Micro benchmarking automatically mm -hmm. within it. Just You said echo on, how about timing on, and then you start giving me milliseconds. It's a great idea, it's a possibility, yeah. Who's writing all these good ideas down? I am. <laughs> He's the PM. Yeah, no, that's a great <laughs> idea. I mean, that feels a little bit like the performance tips that we have when you're debugging in Visual Studio, right? It's great. You step over, yeah. you get a little measurement. Yeah. You hit your API, okay. you get a little measurement. I like all it. All right, so I'll assume you're writing that down. So I love that idea. Color, uh, timing. I like, what about autocomplete? If you type, like if I wanted to put something, I type, I type put, can I type P and hit tab? Yep. Nice. Nice. Oh. It'll auto complete through the things that it knows about, which um, you know, if the the commands that are available to it, the endpoints that are available to it. So if I do CD, it um, goes through the the possible endpoints there. Um, if you're doing the headers, it auto completes the headers, um, which uh, I think is just a hard coded list right now. But we can find a way to make that dynamic if we need to. Um, and yeah, we we auto complete where we can for sure. I mentioned I mentioned verbs being uppercase. I don't know why I'm caught up on that, but aesthetically, I would want verbs to autocomplete to auto uppercase and be uppercase the whole time. Yeah, I'm gonna make a note of that. Also, I was interested in what the the URLs. If I typed in connect pet store swagger with mixed case, it would it would persist that case all the way through. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's an easy fix. 
And then I'm not sure, I have mixed feelings about the, the teal, Tilda, how do you pronounce that? Tilda. The Tilda. Um, because it's, a Tilda is not a thing that you see showing up in a, in a path very often, you see either a greater than sign or a dollar sign. And are we effectively adopting the tilde and saying, this is our thing now, darn it. You know what I mean? I, like that's what, when you're CDing into a URL, tilde is where it's at. I'm curious if anyone feels strongly. I mean, again, we're nitpicking a lovely thing, so we don't mean to pick <laughs> on you for nitpicking the nittiest of nits, but I'm curious what the audience thinks about that. Yeah, I don't actually know, you know, where the decision for the tilde came from. It's just been there. <laughs> well, the thing, the thing that's great about these kind of features is that you just be intentional about it, and all you have to do is say, yes, that was the way we always meant it to be, and then we would believe you, <laughs> exactly. right? Um, another folks are saying, what about command history? You can go up, 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 and hit, like, command history like the shell? Yep. And what me, about control R? Let me switch back here, and so you can see the command history. I'm just hitting Lovely. Look up at that. and down. Okay, what about control R for reverse search like a shell? If I had a quite a, if I had a, you know, like when you're in a shell and you hit control R like in Ubuntu, it goes, it's just a reverse search of the command history. Oh, cool. Uh, yep. That does not currently work. That'd be a cool thing because you might have done a whole complicated bunch of stuff. The other question is, let's say that I've got this all perfect. Can I just go and say save and dump the commands out to a text file that could then be replayed later? Not currently. That's another good suggestion. Good. You don't mind these suggestions, do you? Oh, this Not is great. This is what we're doing. <laughs> it's fantastic. So, so uh, Dan on the chat here says that the tilde normally means the home folder. It does. Which means that maybe having it at the end, you know, appended at the end of a URL maybe sends a weird message uh, as it, it's, it's expressed. It's like you're reading it as URL and then home kind of floating at the end. So I wonder yeah, what, I you, actually... awesome, what awesome widget we could put at the end there that would not be a tilde. See my tilde on my... Shell in Ubuntu, so yeah. See, I like your power line action there. Yeah. That looks good. Got that from your blog post. <laughs> Very nicely done, sir. Folks in the chat are supportive of my nitpicking because they say product <laughs> people love love nitpicking. <laughs> I think this is great. So this makes me very it. happy. Is there something as far as like, say I'm exploring and stuff, am I capturing? Is there a way to like capture output? I, d I don't even know what I'm asking for here, but like- well, I want to type save and get everything that was input. And then I want to be able to say, he said echo on, let's say logging on, and then it would default to output.txt. And I would just get a running log of everything that I'm typing. Yeah, right now there's no, there's no output from it, but I can see that Angelos was taking notes on that. So. That should be easy, right? So, yeah. No brainer, really. We do yeah, have... I love it when people have ideas and you're like, oh, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to code it, right? So it's easy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> this is already shipped, right? Like the thing that we just asked for five seconds ago, you've already pushed that to production? We do have... What's... Um, it, the, uh, there is a run command that allows you to run scripts of things, but you have to have handwritten those scripts to begin with. Um, yeah. So it certainly would be nice to be able to do it, get it to what you want it to be, save that script for later, and then use the run command. I I wonder if I were, this is interactive. This is an interactive shell. Where do you see this living in a world with HTTP, IE, and WGET, and curl, and things like that? Is this, like, you know I mean? Like, like, I know that I can run, HTTP, IE is kind of the standard one, or HTTP, PI where you type the word HTTP and you can do stuff, but it's not interactive. You live in your shell and then you do the, you do a thing and then you put your back in your shell. Would you ever look at this as a do something and get back out or is this always meant to be an interactive shell? It is a REPL, right? It is not a... Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's, it, I mean, I think the idea of a session is very powerful and um, deep integration with ASP.NET is what's gonna set this apart with from the other mm -hmm. tools. Um, gotcha. I think that's where we're going to try and add value rather than compete and try to, you know, create something very similar. We're going to try and differentiate by deep integration. And and the idea of the session, I think, is for learning and exploring. I think that's powerful, and sharing with other team, other team members, and things like that. So, go ahead. Well, as far as the integration with tools kind of stuff, how, is it something where it's always kind of focused on CLI only, or or or, or and and then I've. I, 
and, and I've been jumping back and forth because we've been troubleshooting some video stuff, but did you show already hooking in as a Visual Studio browser? Like, no, but so I, can, I can show you all of that right now. I can show you how to get it and then how to integrate it with your, uh, with your favorite tools. That'd be cool. Uh, so this is being shipped right now as a .NET Core global tool. It means that if you have the SDK, .NET Core SDK on your machine, uh, all you need to do is fire up the .NET tool install command. Uh, dash G makes it global. And then uh, the, the name of our packets is Microsoft.NET hyphen HTTP repo. Uh, so you should be uh, able to see my screen right now. And um, because I already have it installed, you can also update it at any point, but just replacing install with update, right? And then the tool will get uh, either updated to the latest version, or it will just get uh, reinstalled from, from scratch to make sure everything works great. So now that you have it on your machine, if you want to integrate it with Visual Studio, uh, I'll show you how to do that. And there's also a way to integrate it with Visual Studio Code. Um, now I want to point out that this is our very first release. And this is taking advantage of an existing accessibility point in Visual Studio. This is not where we're going to end integration. This is our first step. Uh, so it's not perfect. But give us feedback as to what you want to see better and work differently. And it's on our backlog to make improvements in this integration. Uh, so I'll start off by showing you how typically you can start, um, you can decide which server you're going to use your, um, you're going to run your application on and which browser you're going to fire up after the application starts. Uh, so there's an accessibility point in VS on Windows. Uh, at the end of this menu, you can click Browse With. And then any command line tool can be integrated into VS. And then as far as VS is concerned, it's going to treat it like a browser. So here I have my list of existing browsers. I can just click Add. And all I need to do now is point to the REPL. Uh, global tools uh, will give you an exit on Windows. So I can just point straight to that. So I just go to C, Users, My Home. And net. So under your home directory, dot, dot net is where all the global tools are going to be installed under a subfolder called tools. So here you see I have my uh, HTTP REPL exe, the Win32. Uh, so here's the full path in case anybody missed it. And there's also a blog post we can link to that has all of these details as well, which pencils and stuff. I don't have to provide any special arguments because Visual Studio by default will. Uh, give the starting URL to the command line. So by doing this, uh, close this dialog, you will see here my, um, my web browser option now has a new uh, entry called .NET REPL. And now all I have to do is fire it up. And Visual Studio will start the web server. And then it's going to call my command line. It's going to fire up HTTP REPL. The base URL for the project will be passed in by default. And then the connect command is going to go and discover the swagger endpoint and be good to go. Give it a sec. My machine, but, my machine is running a lot of virus scanning. It's, it's, it's and, <laughs> and that that same idea is how you would add that to uh, uh, to the tab in the new terminal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is mm -hmm. just a shell that you're going to shell out to, and it's totally up to you. You just need to pass in the right stuff, and it will do the right thing. Right, yeah. Um, so that's how you would do it in VS. If I stop this now, I'll show you how to do the same thing in VS Code. So that's great if you're building an API project, like running the project isn't useful anyways. You're just gonna get like a, right? You're just gonna get exactly. a controller or, or nothing. You'll, right. and, and this is much better. I hit F5 and I can right. interact with. And, and this is just a, I don't know if anybody's gonna find this useful, but you might as well know about it. If you go on the select web browsers menu entry, uh, you can actually have multiple startup. So if you really wanted the browser, because you want to use you know Swagger UI to explore it, but you also want the command line, uh, it's 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 not a uh, or. You can have both if you really wanted to. Uh, oh, that's it, great. It, it will say you're going to launch multiple browsers now. Yeah. All right. So back to VS Code. It's the same the same project, but um, in VS Code we do debugging configurations. So all you have to do is come up and add a new configuration. And the type is going to be launching a .NET Core console app, because that's what the global tool is. I'm going to give it an easy name called HTTP REPL. Um, this I'm going to delete, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. Um, but yeah, if you 
you want to build before you run it, that's perfectly fine. The program we're going to run is .NET because what I want to do here is I don't want to use the exe because uh, that's platform specific. I want to show you how to do it in a platform agnostic way. So here we're going to be executing .NET that is available on all platforms. And then we're going to tell it, well, I actually want HTTP REPL. Um, it's the first argument that's going to be passed in. And then the second argument is going to be my starting URL. And I think the port is uh, 520. Now, oh, and I also want to make sure I use the integrated terminal here. So then uh, the command window will open within VS, uh, VS Code on the bottom. So now that I have my configuration saved, this will just launch the tool, but it won't launch my web browser, my web server, sorry, at the same time. Uh, so VS Code has what is called compound configurations. So if you go to the top and you say add compounds, uh, this way you can tell VS Code to execute more than one debugging configuration at the same time. And that's why I removed the pre-built step. Um, because what I'm going to tell it to do now is first launch the configuration for the web server, which is what VS Code gives me by default. And then after that, please follow it with HTTP REPL. So if I save this now, then I should be able to select my compound configuration. Oh, oh, let me rename that to debug with zero. And then we can launch that. Time. There we go. Oops. Click the one too many times. So now we have the integrated terminal showing us uh, the output from HTTP REPL, just like before. And if we stop debugging, everything goes away. So it's all nice, encapsulated nicely. And that's launch setting for the application itself. So I can configure that specific to, like, if I'm building an API project, I can just build that in for the launch configuration there. Yeah, and we're looking into finding better ways of letting you define that you want to use HTTP REPL for your project. A few ideas have been flying around, like maybe uh, launch settings for JSON. We are definitely looking into it. Please tell us what the ideal way would be. Um, we It's on our backlog. We, we want to make improvements here, so we have bandwidth. We, we're ready to go. Cool. Uh... Is that, so if we gone through all the all the features, yeah, for the first release, okay. uh, I did um, uh, real quick. Just wanted to show since Scott mentioned it, I hooked up uh, Windows Terminal to load up HTTP REPL, connecting to that uh, pet store endpoint that I showed earlier. So just as he mentioned, that will work. It's pretty easy awesome. to do in the. Uh, in... And what's so nice about that is you can have the Azure Cloud Shell as a tab. You can have the HTTP REPL as a tab. I mean, whatever yeah. you want to do, whatever makes you happy. Exactly. So no. did you guys show the um, the repo? Like, we've been saying, hey, if you have ideas or whatever, I mean, obviously, they can tell us on, on the current stream and stuff, but sh people should be logging issues on the HTTP REPL um, GitHub project, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just gonna pull Where it is up. it? Yeah. It's under github.com. And it recently .net. moved, right? Moved yeah. from the lab to. It, it's moved. It, it's moved like four times in the last <laughs> year, I think. Um, as of about three weeks ago, it was on. It, it's on .NET now. It's .net. on .NET now. Yeah. And I don't no. think this browser has my credentials. So let me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was on ASP.NET slash HTTP REPL, and uh, we just got it moved to .NET HTTP REPL, which broke all my integrations with all the build servers and everything. And so that was fun. Is there a reason for it name. to be .NET REPL instead of HT or ASP.NET REPL? Uh, consolidation things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think uh, there's there's going to be some more. You see me struggle with my answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be we more about that consolidation, but um, we're just 
since we hadn't actually had an official release, we just went ahead and, and did that move yeah. um, now before we had the first official release. Okay. Cool. And yeah, we've got, we got some open issues there. We've been fixing things um, as people have been uh, bringing them to us. We've accepted a couple of uh, PRs from the community already, so that's been nice. Um, so, yeah, we'd love to get more in there, whatever anybody has. Very cool. Yeah. Um, as, as part of, like, you're, you're here from the web tools team, so I I'm, didn't want to totally change the subject if we want to go more into HTTP REPL, but I, I also did want to ask if there's more stuff web tools-wise, because we haven't really dug into web tools for a while. Um, is there, is there more stuff that we should be aware of that you folks are working on? Yeah, definitely. I can talk a bit about um, some of the other work uh, my team is doing, which is around publishing from Visual Studio on Windows. Cool. Um, and specifically around getting Visual Studio to understand your application dependencies. So what I have here is I've started the publish process for Visual Studio, and I've told it to go and find an existing app service. Uh, on my subscription, it's found a bunch, and I pick an existing one called Web Application, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I click OK, and that's going to go and hit the Azure endpoint and try and read some information from it. Um, you get all the kind of stuff you expect, like what resource group is it created in, uh, what kind of target framework, and all that kind of stuff. But what's new for us and what we're working on is this new dependency section at the bottom. Um, the idea here is that Publish can succeed and your application cannot run at all, right? If, if, you, if your application depends on the database, uh, Publish can think, oh, yeah, yeah, I've put all the files up there and everything is great. Uh, but when the application starts to run, uh, you might think to yourself, oh, startup error. Um, I don't know what's going on. Maybe the application is broken, Publish failed, uh, something didn't, didn't work correctly. Well, all that happened was that we kind of gave you a false sense of security. We kind of told you it's all great, all green, and you are <laughs> anticipating uh, a working startup page. Um, what we're not really doing is we're not checking that your application is ready to be run. We're checking that all of the things that we're supposed to put there are there. We now want to go to the extra step and say, well, what does this application need to actually run successfully? Not just what does it need to be a successful deployment. And what we quickly realized is we need to be aware of what your application depends on. Because otherwise, uh, we're just not going to be able to give you enough information about whether it's going to start. Now, we know that even the most basic of working applications need some type of data store. So we started this journey there. We started by trying to understand dependencies against Azure Storage and SQL Server, because we're hoping that's going to get us to exercise the whole framework, the whole thinking. And the plan is to always add as many dependencies as we can. So expect uh, being able to have a dependency against a microservice on a Swagger API to be a dependency we can understand and do something about. Uh, Maybe if you're using Kivul to manage your secrets, we should be able to understand that and help you transfer your secrets from your uh, secrets XML or JSON file to your Kivul when you're publishing, things like that. Um, but this is the first step to the journey, and we want to get as much figure as possible because we don't want to create something that is proprietary here. We don't want to create something that you have to use this tool to get this benefit, even though you've already done the task, now you have to redo the task with this tool. Uh, because the, the classic problem we have is you, you work on some code, you're adding dependencies, you're adding NuGet packages, you're writing the code, and then the tool says, well, I know nothing about this code base. Can you tell me what dependencies it has? That's the most annoying thing in the world, right? Having to retell it exactly what you just did. So we're trying to come up with strategies that let us take all the pain away of you having to tell us what the code needs and us trying to understand it. Um, so we have some fuzzy logic around that. We have some user input that verifies it. But the end goal is to come up with an environment and the list of dependencies so then we can help you publish that application anywhere successfully. Now, starting with app service, if we go back to my basic, thank you. Um, we click the Add button. We currently support three Azure services, Azure Signal R, Azure SQL Database, and Azure Storage. And if you add any of them, let's say we have a new storage account. We are both provisioning or letting you pick an existing instance, but we're also creating a dependency between the app service and this dependent service that you're creating. I'm going to pick a random one here. It doesn't really matter. Uh, now, this is the first step where we want to get better. 
Now here I have to retype the connection string name that this application uses for this connection. We're working on being able to automatically detect the connection strings the application is already using and making this a simple drop down. So let's say this So based on when I run my app, it's just gonna say, oh, you connected here yeah. and it's gonna Exactly. This will be my marketing database or my operations database that I'm connected to. Now, when we're adding this dependency, we want to remember that you need this dependency, even if you go and you publish this application somewhere else, even if it's in two months' time, even if it is a completely different environment, maybe you go from Windows to Linux, it doesn't matter, the application still needs these dependencies. We're starting off by uh, persisting this dependency on Azure App Service as a tag. So any, uh, any service in Azure has a key value pair that can be used to uh, add metadata to it. So we're taking advantage of that ability to tag it, to know that this has a dependency. Now the idea being that if in the future I publish an application again, it will automatically remember this dependency for me. Now, the, the hope in the future is that if I come here and I say, oh, I want a new published profile, because now I want to push this application, let's say, to Linux, the previous published profile and all of its information should feed into the next one so that you just have a list of things to go through, check, 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 and provision, and then you're finally able to publish. We're not quite there yet because we have this problem to solve. If I go back to connected services, I, all I did was I double clicked on the connected services node here in Solution Explorer. We have uh, some nice tooling here that lets you add capabilities to your application. Classic example here is adding Key Vault or adding cloud storage. Um, and it's a very convenient way to get the right NUCA packages. Uh, so let me just show you how that works. Very similar to the previous screen that you saw. You can pick an Azure storage and tell it what connection this is. This is my marketing DB. And I'm going to add it. This will install the right NUCA packages. And then I should be ready to write my code to consume it. There was one question we didn't ask during this uh, experience. What are you using? Oh, sorry, this is where, where my connection string is going to end up in uh, my secrets file. So there was only one question we didn't ask during this, which was, what are you adding this dependency for? Is this supposed to be used even when you F5 your application locally? Or are you trying to prepare your code for when you put it in production and you want to use Azure Storage? Because maybe you want to use the Azure Storage emulator locally. The, the difficult question that was omitted during this experience was, for what environment do you want this dependency for? But because Visual Studio doesn't really have the idea of environments yet, that question is omitted. And then we kind of have to guess. Um, so what we're trying to do right now is figure out a way to bring the idea of environments into Visual Studio without creating something proprietary. So think of having to persist this list of dependencies, but in a way that it's not proprietary to Visual Studio, that I can go work in Visual Studio code, I can add a bunch of dependencies through the code, and if I bring it back into VS, it just lights up. It's not some extra step that you have to do. There's many ideas being thrown around, which is, for example, we could just take advantage of Docker files, save all the metadata in a Docker file, even if we don't use a Docker image. That's still a standard that everybody understands, other tools can use. A repo that already has Docker in it, you can immediately read it. We could come up with our own proprietary file format that gives us more flexibility, but then the community has a harder time integrating with it. And it would be, I've, I've tried to ask this question before in MVP summits and um, other forums, but I would love to get feedback again. Uh, what ideally would the community like to see here? How would you like Visual Studio to start persisting this metadata about your environment so that you're not locked in, but you also feel like there's great value there and you can take advantage of it and do something that you maybe couldn't do before in such a short amount of time. Um, the overall goal here is to help you provision, publish, and have the application run successfully. It's that last step that currently we're trying to close, that last gap. Because we can know from uh, Azure and MS Deploy and other deployment frameworks if something was successful, but then we need to know if the application will run as well. Um, if people see this as, as helpful and useful, we'd love to hear the feedback. If people think that 
No, they should be left up to CICD and published should be super simple and you shouldn't worry about dependencies. We want to hear that feedback too. Uh, I know there's two different camps on here. Uh, I've, I've done user studies, I've done surveys, and I know it's kind of like split 50-50. Uh, but still, good ideas come from this discussion. So I just want to get the ideas going. So what I just showed um, is available in 16.2 and 16.3. 16.2 added signal R, and we're hoping to add key vault uh, fairly soon. Cool. cool. Yeah, I've been running into that some lately. You know, the, just the whole kind of, like, I, I do love that I can manage secrets and that it's something that, is being thought of like in ASP.NET Core. There's and, and we talked about before, user secrets is really great. But then kind of how I work with that um, across multiple environments does get complicated. So right. So you yeah. So let's say you provision Key Vault and you add support for it. Do you want to use it for a five? Maybe maybe not. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, a question on the chat: uh, If we considered using MS Build properties for configuring. Yes. Um, we don't know how extensible that is and how how truly cross-platform that is. Um, we're definitely looking into it. We've There's also an open source project called Como that Microsoft is working on. We've considered that too. I guess my question is, why would you like it to be MS Build Properties? Why do you see that as being the, a good solution? Maybe, maybe you have an idea that we haven't thought of because everything tends to have trade-offs. Um, yeah, we, basically the main argument against that is there's not much tooling out there that will be able to use it and nobody else would want to produce it. We would be the only ones that would want to produce that kind of data, right? Um, whereas with the idea of a Docker file, then anybody that wants to eventually use Docker uh, can find value in that. Uh, it's kind of not like throw away in, in a sense. I guess I would, you know, you showed some of that stuff of like it discovering what I'm using, what resources I'm using and stuff. So like intelligent generating that Docker file for me would be nice too. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so, the, so the, the feedback here is that it, it, the project already has project configuration. So yeah, that starts release and development and debug. Um, so that's a good point. You do get that for free. Here's, here's where I'm going to... I'm going to make this problem even even harder for people. So the funny thing is we keep saying, oh, I'm going to work on my local F5. And then somebody says, well, what if I'm F5ing into Azure Dev Spaces? What if I'm F5ing into a virtual machine? That's not local anymore. Um, so there is a bit of a vocabulary limitation here, too. What we really mean is the F5 environment, whatever you want to call that, your F5 loop, and then your non-F5 environments. So yes you have the idea of debug versus release in MS Build, but what there's a metrics here of what project configuration you want in which environment. Uh, so it's not just a matter of just adding more configurations. It's about mapping them to something. Makes sense. Uh, all right. Is there anything else you guys want to show off any, or talk about? Mm, I think that's, that, that covers it. Yeah. Okay. So. That's, that's, uh, so thanks a lot. Um, this is, this has been great and I do want to regularly check back in with you as, and you know, as you're releasing new features, it was cool. Um, seeing the blog posts on HTTP REPL and I reach out to Tim, you know, and, and, but in the future, as you're working on new things, We'd love to yeah. you know, keep keep bringing it to the community. Sounds good. Cool. I did see All right. somebody asked about um, auth on there. It, uh, I swear yeah. that's the, the most common question that we get. And yes, we we do have plans. Um, we'd love to you know hear more feedback on what auth scenarios you think should be supported in there. Um, you know, we got some people that even requested the uh, I don't even know the right name for it, but the, the scenario where it will pop up the web browser for you to log in with it, which obviously wouldn't work in a um, you know a scripted uh, environment with a run command or anything, but it could work in in the more interactive way. Um, but it, you know, definitely want to hear the feedback on what's the scenarios that people see off being yeah. useful for in this. Yeah, it could tell you like go to this URL and enter this code to authenticate, right? Rather than yeah, yeah. But that's that's definitely yeah. An approach, yeah. 
we, we definitely have plans for authentication. Absolutely. You're going to see progress there. And as a reminder for folks, if they are wanting to keep a close eye on this, you can always just watch that repo, right? You can yep. watch for releases or watch. Um, so that's a good way to yep, yep. Cool. All right. Well, I, th I think we can wrap up there. Um, sorry for, for folks watching. Sorry, there was some hiccups with the YouTube. We'll make sure that we get the right video posted on YouTube for watching later. And, and um, great that Twitch was working well. So. Well, cool. all right. Well, thanks a lot. And I think one of those buttons wraps up the show. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Take care.